ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Garage Gym Athlete Podcast. I'm your host, Jared Moon. The Garage Gym Athlete Podcast is a result of my desire to build better humans, unequivocal coaches, and autonomous athletes. I've spent the last several years obsessing over program design, nutrition, and every other way you can optimize human performance. This podcast distills the latest scientific research with what I've learned and blends it with the not-so-scientific field of mental toughness. We are here to build you into a dangerously effective athlete. If you enjoy this podcast, you can find out more about our training at garagegymathlete.com. And if you want to pursue more into the field of coaching and programming, head to endof3fitness.com. Thanks for listening. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Garage Gym Athlete Podcast. Jared Moon here with Kyle Schramm and Joe Courtney. Gentlemen, how's it going? What's up? What's up? Fantastic. Back in the land of the U.S. And it's already having an, an effect on your accent. <laughs> yeah, he's back. And uh, he's actually in EO3 HQ right now in the, in the nest, we call it, the perch. I got I got the top floor corner office, so I'm moving on up in the world. With a view, no less. Um, yeah, <laughs> a dead limb and uh, some some brush. All right. Well, let's get into it today. Um, we are covering a study called the Goldilocks Zone for Exercise. Not too little, not too much. This study was done in 2018, and I really think everyone should just go read this. Uh, it's it's much more of a scientific paper than it would be a study. Um, I couldn't actually even determine what it was. Like we do um, meta analysis, we do systematic reviews, and I, if I had to guess, this would be more along uh, the lines of a systematic review. Like it, it's going over a bunch of other studies that they pulled up. Um, and so it's really, really interesting, um, big premise here for the study is they, they did look at a bunch of observational studies to try and draw conclusions about dosing for exercise. Uh, specifically, they looked at age related stuff and cardiovascular. And I saw the notes that you guys had. So I'll let you pull out a lot of the little details, but big picture, they're looking at so many different studies. So if you check out the show notes, you might want to just check out this study in general, read it over. It reads very easily. Um, and so what they were looking at was really just all these different uh, relations between exercise and, you know, the, the dosing before you get a problem. And, and we all know if you don't exercise at all, it's going to be a huge issue. Um, and we've talked about this reverse J-shaped curve when it comes to to specifically upper respiratory infections um, that people who don't exercise get um, sick, you know, a certain amount. And then uh, people who exercise, let's say the right amount, get sick half as much as sedentary people. And then the people who exercise too much, let's say, get sick twice as much as the sedentary individuals. And so this is kind of like a looking, it's not looking at that specific study, but it's looking at a lot of those things. And this is going to something more serious than, um, a upper respiratory infection, a lot of these things are looking at cardiac problems. And so ar arterial fibrillation, like all these different things. Like it, yeah, I think you'd have to be like a heart doctor to uh, a cardiologist to basically understand all the different things that they're looking at. Um, but a lot of these things are, are pretty serious. And I thought that we should go over it. We've talked about age recently on the podcast um, and how when it comes to your metabolic health, there isn't much of a difference, but it turns out if you're hitting it hard and heavy on the endurance side after the age of, I think I pulled kind of 45, um, you can have a lot of, a lot of different problems. And so we'll get into some of the details, uh, but that's the, you know, the big picture of it is like there, there is a certain amount of exercise that you should probably hit. There's too little, there's too much. Um, and if you just think about your heart as a muscle, if you're operating like in zone four, or zone five, um, for an hour, you know, five days a week, that's just a lot. That's like, that's as, 
you are maxing out that that muscle, right? And, and so this logically, it makes sense that there would be there'd be a dosing that's too much. That'd be like if you wanted to, uh, you know, back squat at ninety to a hundred percent of your one rep max back squat every single day of the week with really high volume, as many as you could do, like you would think that that would be bad for your body at some point. And so it really shouldn't come to surprise as people, even though, you know, we're basically pulling a study that's like, Hey, exercise in the wrong dosing can be bad for you, which is really interesting. But I honestly think more, more of our athletes lean this direction. Like we're not podcasting uh, to a bunch of people who are probably sitting around doing nothing and we're trying to urge mm -hmm. them to get off the couch. Uh, we probably have more athletes who are in this zone of doing too much and, and could be detrimental to their heart health. Uh, so I, I'll just throw it to you guys. Like, what'd you think overall about, about the study? Yeah. So, uh, uh again, we're, we're really helping out our older athletes who it's a lot of time to ask for a little bit more, uh, guidance, but I'm going to kind of skip ahead. Cause one of the things that really, really stuck out to me is even though you just mentioned that, um, most of our athletes might border on the line of too much, um, depending on what, what, uh, if they're doing something extra on top of our programming. But one of the things that the study mentioned is that even though the U-shaped curve had people past it, uh, if you do too much that you'll have all these bad effects of, of uh, cardiovascular or um, coronary and, and, all, and all that is on average, 20 times more adults don't do enough versus doing too much. So but before we get into you know, telling people not to do too much, don't, don't hear, we're not saying and say, oh, maybe I just need to do less because I'm getting older. No, it's only if you're doing like marathon training above four, four to five hours of intense, high intensity stuff each week. So, it, it, and that's another point they, that the study kind of made was like, yes, you shouldn't do this craziness, but you should still be active all of your life. You should still be low activity. You should still be doing uh, active rest and that lifelong activity found an increase of six years, at least on your, on, on longevity. So, um, yeah, that's the main, the, 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 really the biggest one that I are, uh, interesting thing that I wanted to put, bring up is that even though we're talking about people doing too much and overtraining, when you get older, you're, it's still 20 times more likely that adults nowadays aren't even doing enough. Um, but I will pass this on to Kyle, cause there's a lot, a lot of us, the takeaways are fairly, fairly similar parallel, um, throughout these different studies. Yeah. And they, they talk a whole lot about just about longevity. And so really it's, you, you have to, you have to frame things properly of like, what is the goal here? What is the goal? What are we talking about? Right. Or do we want to, obviously we, we all want to live longer, right? We want to lower our risk of, of things that could kill us. Right. But at the same time, you, you go through periods of training of for, for various goals, right? Like if you have an event coming up, like you do this kind of stuff, right? You do this kind of training. Uh, but we're talking about like doing this kind of training for the long term over a long period of time there. And that's what they're talking about as well. They're not talking about people who train for one marathon, right? They're talking about people who train for marathons, multiple marathons a year for a long period of time for a number of years stacked on top of each other. Um, and especially the effects that that has on your body over time as you get older. And it's not necessarily just because you're getting older, right? But it's simply because if you've put your money, it's just like what, what Jared said, if you've put your heart through this much training and especially this much high intensity training for a long, long period of time, your heart's just going to wear out. That's just what's going to happen. And so uh, the longer that you go with training like that, the, the more your risk goes up of things that, that could kill you and especially kill you suddenly. Um, but they, they talk about, um, especially for running, especially for, for, um, cardio, uh, longevity improvement plateaus at five to six miles per week. So if you're running five to six miles per week, like the benefits that you have to longevity to literally living longer, they plateau at five to six miles a week. So if you're putting in five to six miles, that's it. That's as, that's as much as you can do to improve your longevity. Um, obviously not talking about any other type of goals. We're talking about that one specific thing. Um, but putting in five to six miles a week, that that's as much as you need to do in order to maximize your longevity when it, when it comes to this. Um, they also talk a lot about people who sit too much, right? And I think exactly what, what Joe was talking about, I don't think uh, we're really worried about 
or really talking to people who um, who are doing too much. We might have some people in a community that are doing too much, but it's much, much more likely we're going to have people, um, maybe not in the community, but people who know other people around the community um, that, that are doing too little and maybe just sitting too much. Even if you're training, even if you're following our training on a weekly basis, you may have a job where you're sitting all day. And honestly, even for me, as a member of the team here, like I work for digital businesses, I work on a computer. Like basically all the work that I do for my job is on a computer. So if I want to, I could, outside of my training, right? I could sit in a chair all day long if I wanted to, you know what I mean? So uh, they talk about that as well, about like getting up and moving and and how important that is and and things like that. So uh, anyway, pass it back off to back off to Jared. What What are some things you've got? Yeah. So, I, I mean, just diving in kind of what we, what you guys are hitting on. Um, definitely there's going to be way more people who are um, sitting on their ass and not doing enough. And the reason I didn't, I didn't cater towards that side is just, I don't, you know, there are athletes who are in the community. Yeah. They follow our programming, but they do other stuff. You know, I, I know a lot of athletes who are like that. Uh, they they're plugging in extra aerobic training and maybe they're getting for race. And I feel like you just have to make this decision at some point of you have to know that you're chasing performance at the detriment of something like, and, and that's just the truth of the matter. Like, and I've always had these kind of thoughts, I guess, more of a philosophical type view of this performance uh, stuff is, is all kind of new. Like, um, I just finished reading the book, the perfect mile, um, really great book trying to get the team to read it. Um, uh, and it's, very, it's about very subtly, very subtly. And it's about, um, the kind of the race to break the four minute mile, because there are a bunch of guys, three specifically that were like primed to do it. And, uh, they, they just kept race after race doing it. But if you look at it, even then in the fifties, 1950s, it was like performance-based stuff was like kind of new. Like Roger Bannister, who broke the four minute mile, was a full time medical student and trained about as much as we do now, as far as time wise. Like, and he broke the four minute mile. You know, he went sub four. And uh, it was just coming online then that people were like, oh, well, we could train more and we could do more. And so we, I don't think we've seen how this plays out. You know what I mean? I don't think we've mm -hmm. seen how these elite performance based athletes. Uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm sure everyone's going to drop off at some point, but I don't think what we've, we've seen what really happens. Um, and, and I'm, I'm very interested to see exactly what happens over the years. But I also had the, the thought of, you know, if you're going from uh, vigorous or let's say sedentary to vigorous exercise, you know, that's, that's one thing that I thought the study may have overlooked because if you are haven't exercised in a while, say you're over the age of 45 and you want to run a marathon in the next couple of weeks, I can see that being incredibly stressful on your heart. I know when I ran a marathon untrained, like did no running and then ran a marathon, my heartbeat felt kind of erratic, you know, especially that night and the next day, like I guarantee I did something that my heart had to recover from. And again, it, it makes a lot of sense when you're just looking at your heart as a, as a muscle, um, but they, there's this one little quote from the study that veteran endurance athletes, meaning they've done a lot of endurance training, um, have approximately a five fold higher incidence of arterial, arterial fibrillation compared with sedentary individuals, despite solid evidence, evidence that a routine of moderate exercise decreases the risk of AF with excessive strenuous exercise, the AF risk rises dramatically, particular for persons older than the age of 45. So they were even looking at not just people who go in from sedentary to individual. So again, going back to my original statement of like, I don't think we've seen how all this all shakes out. Like, I don't mm -hmm. think we know what chasing performance does continuously. And, and I think about this for bodybuilders too. I think hypertrophy is a very safe way of training, but like when you have like 0% body fat and you're nothing but like solid muscle, like we're, you're forcing your body to do something weird right? Like something mm -hmm. unnatural. That is not the natural state for a human being. It's impressive. Like the dedication and discipline. Don't get me wrong. Like that, those things are impressive, 
four minute miles are impressive. Three minute mile, three and what do you know, whatever those things are impressive, but like there has to be a cost in my opinion. This is getting, stepping away from the science. I just feel like there has to be a cost to all of these things to chasing performance. And the reason I also don't think we've seen it, you're like, well, professional athletes, um, you know, could be the counter argument. Like we've kind of seen how some of their career works out, but I don't, professional athletes aren't the same as um, performance based for like exercise. And, and I don't mm. just mean CrossFit. I mean like a track and field event or, you know, running these more monostructural movements. Um, CrossFit would be included in that. But, uh, you know, if you take a professional basketball player, they're not the strongest person in the world. They're not the, they can't run long distances. Like they have a skill set. It's a very skilled thing. But when you're just talking about brute force exercise, um, I think that there's definitely something that goes, goes along with that. I mean, we did, we did see what happened to what happens to NFL players who bang their head, uh, too many times for too many years, right? Like there's a huge problem mm -hmm. with that too. Just these things are not natural for humans to do. And this is kind of putting that in, into perspective that, uh, it, it's just like uh, spinach, like spinach is good, right? Like it's good to have some, but if, if I were to have, you know, 10 cups of spinach every day of my life, I'll probably end up with some problems, some weird mm. stuff that just wasn't intended because it's, it's not natural for your body to, to handle that much. Um, and then I, I was going to read some other stuff here, but I want to see, did you guys have anything else that you wanted to cover study wise or anything else? Yeah. Some like application wise, just for, for people. Um, one of the last things that, that, they, that they brought up was that uh, it is just another part of the study that long-term marathon running in men was associated with increased coronary artery plaque as well. So increasing your plaque and plaque is not a good thing to have. Um, but, and I know that this thing talked, this study talked about a lot about specifically running. Cause I think it's just one of those main things that older athletes do activity wise and uh, probably easier sample size for, for running, but going back to your, your heart as a muscle, think of it as a muscle and um, advice for athletes and what they're doing training wise. So this is, this was athletes doing, uh, six to seven days per week training at that sort of intensity running, but that's any sort of high intensity. So whether it's CrossFit or high intensity interval training, five, six, seven days a week. So even if you're not running, if you're still doing some sort of high intensity training where your heart rate's, you know, 80 plus percent for a while for four to five hours a week, then you probably need to dial it back. And they found that having one to two rest days compared to the people that only, that only had like one, maybe zero rest days per week had significantly um, less markers or, or were better off longevity and cardiovascular wise and, and uh, heart health than, than the ones that didn't. So basically, if you're doing this high intensity stuff, you need to have a low intensity, just regular, even just active rest days. And uh, because those one to two rest days make a huge, huge amount of difference and, you know, have your strength work, um, dial back that intensity on, on, on all those days. Yeah, something I pulled, it was just a just a quote, um, one line from the study, but it said from a pure health standpoint, and again, we're talking about the difference, right? Of like what what is your goal? What what are what are you doing here? But from a pure health standpoint, it is unnecessary to perform vigorous exercise for more than 40 to 60 minutes at a time. So it's kind of like it's like if if you're if you're training, because we we ask people all the time, right? Like, why do you do this? What's your goal? What's your what's your why for training? And so if you're just doing it to be healthy, if you just want to be a healthy person and you want to live as long as you can, you want to attenuate as much risk as possible when it comes to, you know, uh, all cause mortality and things like that, it, it doesn't take a whole lot. It doesn't take a whole lot. It takes intentional movement, takes intentional training, but it doesn't take a whole lot of, of vigorous activity and, and high intensity activity. And I think that's something that we're dealing with um, in the, in the fitness space is there's a lot of influencers out there and things like that who are doing some, some crazy things and encouraging people to, to stay hard and to, to go harder and to do more and all that. And it's really, it's just from a pure health standpoint, it's that the science just doesn't, just doesn't back that up. You know what I mean? Um, and so that, that's just something that I would say as well of like, uh, understand your goals and understand what you're doing. Again, training for performance, training for a specific event, things like that all this changes, this whole conversation changes, right? But just for being a healthy human being and trying to live as long as possible, it doesn't take as much as you think it does. Or zone two. Right. 
Yeah. And that's personally, that's where I want to live on the, on the upper end of the spectrum. I think probably we all, we all do. Like I don't, I've never been an excessive exerciser. I've been in some, some situations in my life where maybe I just had more free time. So I did more things that would be considered exercise, like, uh, and college, you know, like I probably worked out three times a day in college and it was, but like, they weren't like true, like workouts. It was like, I had to work out with the air force for ROTC. I would do like some sort of like bodybuilding thing on my own. And then I'd play like racquetball in the evening or whatever. Like, so the, that, that was a lot of different types of stuff, but not like uh, some sort of obsession with exercise. It's just a very active person. And they mentioned kind of that kind of that thing in here. Like there's, they don't see, there was no detriment to like being more physically active. And so I want to make sure that no one gets that it's, it's when you're like pushing your heart to these like higher levels for prolonged periods of time. If you, if you exercise in your garage or basement or gym or whatever for an hour a day, and it's fairly vigorous, but then you also have an active job or like you are out walking the dog or playing with your kids. That that is of no consequence. And and they, they point that out in the study. It is not going to be an issue. So don't look at it like that. It it really just is this going too hard. Um, and the, you know, the bottom end here, um, isn't where I want to be like the minimum. I don't, what was it? 75 minutes per week or 150 minutes per week, uh, for the CDC guideline was one thing that they recommended. I also don't want to be there. Like, I don't want to be this minimum of 150 minutes, right? Like I want to be closer to 300 minutes of exercise. And it seems like beyond that, if you look at some of the other studies, uh, also published by O'Keefe, which was the guy who uh, wrote this one. Uh, he has more stuff about, you know, specific hourly going too high, like going up to 250 minutes or, or 300 minutes, five hours, six hours, seven hours, like in, and where those become detrimental as well. Uh, but when you're looking at professional or just say recreational endurance athletes who also have a job, they're still training. They're like managing to fit in like 15 hours, 20 hours of training. And personally, I'm always at like the five to six hour per week mark, which is about maybe probably one day off and about an hour the rest of the time. And most of those days are not vigorous. And you would know that if you follow the program, it's not always like high intensity stuff. Um, but what I wanted to talk, like, this is really cool. Most, um, most studies don't put a bow on, on the, on it at the end, but they did with a little, like a little card at the end of it's like a physician exercise prescription. And so I was just going to read all those real fast because I think this, this is going to kind of be my killing comfort takeaway too. Like we can, we can all do our own, but I just wanted to kind of like read through these. Um, so you can kind of gauge and and plan your own personal fitness around it. But the Goldilocks zone for physical activity or physicians exercise prescription, there are a couple of things here. So aim for the CDC physical activity guideline, 150 minutes per week of moderate intense aerobic exercise or 75 minutes per week of vigorous intensity aerobic activity. Try to limit doses of vigorous heart pounding, sweat producing exercise to not more than four to five cumulative hours per week, especially for those over 45 years of age. After 30 consecutive minutes spent sitting, stand up and move, ideally walking briskly for about five minutes, consider a standing desk to reduce prolonged sitting, changing from a completely sedentary lifestyle to one that incorporates even a modest amount of physical activity will confer substantial benefits to mental and physical health. For individuals performing doses of strenuous exercise above recommended levels, considered substituting less aerobically demanding physical exercise, such as walking, yoga, stability exercises, strength training, etc. There appears to be and they kind of are, I kind of already mentioned this. There appears to be no concerns about upper threshold for safety when performing leisure time, low to moderate intense intensity activities, such as walking at a comfortable pace, housework, gardening, basketball, or softball, bowling, volleyball, golf ball, double tennis, uh, and other racket sports, dancing and croquet. Take at least one day per week off from vigorous exercise for very high exercises over 50 years of age. Consider consideration should be given to some cardiac testing. So going in for CT scanning, and uh, all these other things. So I just read all those studies don't normally do that. Like I said, put a bow at the end of their study so perfectly. Uh, but that was, that's basically every takeaway from the study they put in a, in a nice little recap there. Uh, probably stole all your points too for your personal killing comfort things here. But uh, what, what do you guys have for killing comfort? My killing comfort is just kind of follow those guidelines or just follow our programming and you should be good to go. Follow our rest days, follow our intensity guidelines and all that stuff. But uh, what do you guys have otherwise? I think you have every killing comfort that there is on a list, but, um, I, I'd say 
make sure you're being intentional with your the hours that you dedicate to training. So after your four hours of intensity, make sure those are your intensity hours. But then after that, cap your cap your intensity, and then after and then what you're ever, ever doing for the, throughout the week, keep it low intensity. That's when you switch to zone two, and you should be thinking about that in the beginning of the week. Of okay. Monday, Wednesday, Saturday, I'm going to be intense for 90 minutes. And then the other days for training, I'm just going to do some strength. I'm just going to do some zone two, but I'm not going to be intense every day consecutive each day. So uh, be intentional with your intensity and then um, have have some low intensity in between those intense days. So, yeah, my kill and comfort was one of those points. It was the uh, after 30 minutes of sitting um to, to stand up and move so definitely do that one we'll double tap that one but i would also say um i think something that that you can do sometimes is uh follow the shiny object right i think it can get can get easy to follow that shiny object especially when you have uh people on social media or something like that like telling you to 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 work harder to do more like you know like like stay hard all those those kinds of things and and be more intense. And so I would just say, uh, it can be, it can be easy to do that and to bounce around to different ideas and try to implement a bunch of different things. Um, so I would say kill comfort by stay in the course, stay with one thing and focus on one thing and be okay with that one thing being your thing, right. Um, of, of knowing why you train and having your goal for training and not letting other things come in and distract you from what it is that you're doing, because, uh, there are a lot of people out there who are trying to prop up this idea of like, we all need to be harder and we need to work harder and, and be more intense and those things. And like, you know, actually you don't like, especially just to be healthy, just to be a healthy person. You don't have to do those things um, that you, you do need to have a goal and you do need to be purposeful with it. And so pick your goal and stick with it. That's what I would say. And I think this segues very nicely into today's topic because there is a definite like line here of, okay, well, I don't think any of us would be here if we were interested in just uh, walking three days a week and calling it good, or you're not going to look right. how you want. And, and that's kind of the, that's kind of the difference there is like a lot of people do exercise because they want to look, look a certain way. Like, let's not lie. Like, like that that's truth. That's truth for almost everyone involved in fitness. Um, even if you're not, if you're in it for more performance, you still wouldn't be happy if you have this high level performance, but you look obese, like uh, that still wouldn't be a, a cool thing. Um, and, and so we don't want to be on that end of the spectrum where we're okay with walking. Um, and so this, the topic today is, is where's the line? We've covered this before for episode 53, but when you should cut yourself some slack, when it's okay to kind of take things to the back burner, um, or when do you need to be a little bit harder on yourself and, and hold that line, maintain some sort of level of discipline or standard? And where is that? Because it's um, there is a lot. Like Kyle's talking about one extreme. He's specifically calling out Dave David Goggins. Let's not pretend like he's not. He's, he keeps saying stay hard over and over again. That's like David Goggins. Like no one else says that but him. So Kyle is is straight up a little bit scared to call him out directly. So I'll do it for him. He's saying David Goggins is a little too hardcore and a bit ridiculous. And we're not necessarily saying you need to only walk and be healthy. We're kind of in the middle between those two of like, you know, where, where's the standard. And I think that's kind of where this line comes from because uh, the only reason I don't like talking about these topics sometimes is because I don't want us to sound too soft. Cause I don't feel like any of us truly are like, we're all super consistent. Um, and, I think that takes a level of tenacity and discipline that most people don't have. It's just that daily over decades mentality, as opposed to a daily intensity. We're more like, yeah, let's do this every day for several decades. Let's exercise, you know, for the next 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, whatever it is, that's kind of more our mentality, which is still really hard to me is one of the harder, maybe the hardest thing to do from a mental toughness standpoint, but these other people are pushing more, Let's be as hard as we can today. Let's do the, the the hardest thing we can to do do today. And so you have to you have to like know where this line is for you. So let's talk about where the line is, when you should be hard on yourself, when it's okay to cut yourself some slack. Uh, you know, let's kick it off with you, Joe. What do you think on this topic? So uh, you always have to keep your goals in mind, but I think you I think what I 
what I like to do is thinking, thinking back, like thinking uh, um, uh, macro wise in, in your, how, how you, how you just uh, came from for um, training. So three different types of phases. So like, okay, how, how did I do this week? How did I do this past month? How did I do this past cycle? And if you've dropped down to like maybe two training sessions, you haven't been that intense this week and past week. Okay. Well, what were we like the, the week or the month before that? What about the cycle before that? If you were hitting your five days a week up until the last two weeks, then it's fine to cut yourself some slack because it could, you could be moving, you could be traveling, you could be sick, something like that. It happens. You know, we just had, um, Dr. Uh, Morsi on, and he was like, he was doing BCT and all, all uh, doing all this training and doing great. And then he got COVID and sick and he was basically grounded and couldn't do anything. So yes, cut yourself some slack there. And, and like, I, Kyle will have you think I took eight vacations this year. And each time I, I went, I would only train for like once, maybe twice uh, while I was gone or I was doing something active, but I wasn't hitting training sessions. But, you know, just two weeks ago, I was still able to hit my, my back squat goal. And, uh, and it's because like, okay, I knew I could cut myself some slack this, this week or that week. But if you look back for the entire month or cycle, you're still hitting your five days. You're still hitting whatever your, your process goal is on from a macro view. Now, if this is a habit that you're seems to be inquiring of like acquiring of about a month and you're starting to go down to two or three days and you're just going through the motions, then you need to look at things of, okay, why are you slacking? Why is this happening? What do you need to change to get back to where you were process wise? So that's why it's good to look at process goals and have your, you know, training sessions or what, you know, what the study was talking about, your four intense hours a week, and then some low intense ones per week. If you track those and think about those, look at it uh, from afar. And if it's not a trend, then I think you're fine and take into account for what you're doing now. But if it looks like you've been doing it for several weeks or, or a month or two, and it's developing a trend, then you need to figure out, okay, why is this trend happening? How can I get back on course to where I was previously, whether it's a training shift, a goal shift, a mindset shift, you know, maybe it's, maybe you have a goal that you are getting burnt out on, or you might get discouraged from because it's unattainable. So you're just like, well, what's the point anymore? So maybe you need to change your goal. If you're starting to, you know, the slacking has been, um, more, more long-term and habitual. So that's what I would say is look at your um, process across three phrases and see how they compare to one another and see if it is a trend and adjust or don't from there. So I would say um, take a more macro view and look at this as uh, values versus goals. So what I mean by that is um, when you look at something as, as a value that you hold, it's something that you, it's part of your identity. It's who you are. So you look at this as, for instance, you look at this as I'm a healthy person. This is what healthy people do. Healthy people train, healthy people have a program, healthy people eat, you know, eat a, a, a good, well-balanced diet of whole foods, like healthy people. This is what healthy people do. And I'm a healthy person. So that's why I do this. And you can build goals within that that frame especially like we talk about actually we just had some of our uh some of our athletes go and, and run a spartan race together this weekend this past weekend and we've had that we've done that as a team and and you know people do that kind of stuff all the time and people do events on their own you know all the time or or like with joe joe had a, a big back squat that he was chasing and he hit it you know and we had uh, bct had an entire year with an entire specific program you know chasing um specific goals and things like that you can build goals out within within that structure but to me it's more about um taking a macro view of this is this is who i am and so this is what i do and so to me that's what helps me with making sure that i'm hitting my training and things like that i do have goals within that you know things that i want to do but mostly the thing that keeps me coming back and if i do wind up having some inconsistency or something like that um then i just look at it as I'm a healthy person. This is what healthy people do. And I want to be a healthy person for the rest of my life, you know, and I want to live for the, a long time and just kind of going back to what we talked about with the study, right. Um, talking about longevity. Um, but also with values is something that you can pass on more easily to other people. Right. Um, especially like I, Hannah is now on the pro and has been for a while, but like, this is something that Hannah and I share together now as, as a couple, 
And it's something that we're now passing down to our kids as well. Like this is a family value of ours. It's not just, we have goals that we want to meet with our training. It's like that we're healthy people and we take care of our bodies and we take our health very seriously. And this is what people who do that do. And so uh, to me, that's where it, it's all this macro level of this is what healthy people do. And all the rest of this is wrapped into that. And so if you get to a point where, well, I was sick and I didn't train, that's okay. Healthy people get sick sometimes. So you didn't train, do better, you know, do something tomorrow. You know what I mean? Take it, take it and take another day and, and do something better. You know what I mean? It's just what happens, but it's all wrapped up in this values versus goals. Yeah. So I'm, I actually don't really like the, the idea of giving yourself slack. Actually, I really struggle with that, uh, mentality anytime it comes up. Um, because I just, it's a slippery ass slope, you know? Um, it, it really is. I think you, when you lack discipline almost anywhere, it is honestly like a disease. And that's why I wrote killing comfort because it is the slowest creeping cancer out there. Like you think that I'm just going to kind of like, I'm just going to not give it my all here, but I'm going to give it my all in other areas. And then, then you start to slip in this, like, it just, it slowly degrades your life. So I, when we talking about this specific, when can, when, when should you be able to cut yourself some slack? My answer is almost never it's you shouldn't, but you should have a standard. And this is similar to what Kyle's saying. Um, but just a little bit different in my own words, because I talk about this all the time of people having a standard once you kind of set your standard for yourself, that's where you should be good to go. Um, because if you, a, a standard is not perfection. A standard is a standard. So if we look at like a, a PT test in the military, there's the minimum standard and then there's the maximum. So like for the air force last I checked, uh, like the, the mile and a half run was our aerobic test. And I think the, the best you could possibly do was, is like, like close to nine minutes and, uh, you know, maybe, maybe nine Oh five or nine Oh eight or something like that. And the worst you could do depending on age, this is all age dependent. was like, I don't know, in the 13 and a half or even 14 minutes, something like that. Uh, numbers don't matter, but there's a standard, right? Where the air force is still like, yeah, whatever you're good. You didn't max out the standard, but you also, you weren't, you're not below the standard. And so that's what I mean when I talk about standard, I'm not talking about perfection. I'm talking about a range. So if you set a standard for yourself of, I, I'm going to train four days per week, that's the, that's the standard. So some days you might, some weeks you might hit six. That's awesome. You went above the standard, but when you do three, you're now going below your standard or maybe your standard is three, but you need to set that standard for yourself. I really feel like in every area of your life or else complacency, comfort, these things will sneak into your life if you're not careful. And so taking the time to actually think about what your standard is in different areas of your life. Um, I shared this exercise on social media. I do this a lot uh, with people, individual coaching, whether that's fitness coaching, business coaching, whatever. And I call it building Superman. And it's where you sit down. Shouldn't take more than five to 10 minutes. You pick the area of your life and you're essentially kind of writing uh, a job description for whatever it is. And, uh, for me, like a, a, an example I like to use that really resonates with other people is just like being a father. Okay. So if I, if I die today, but and the only thing I'm allowed to do is write down a job description for who will replace me tomorrow. Like that's, let's just say that's how the world worked. Emily would get a new husband. My kids would get a new dad. And I had to write out the standard for what this guy had, like he had to live up to these standards, right? A, a certain level of like, he, this is how he loves his kids. This is how much time he spends with people. So on and or with, with kids, with the, the wife, like all these things, I have to write out the standard. It's almost like a job description that I'm writing now, luckily, uh, and most likely I won't die today. Um, and so, but I have that standard written out, right? So now my only job is to live up to the standard I would expect of someone else in the same position. And when you look at a standard for yourself as someone else is going to come do it, you're normally a little bit tougher. You, we already cut ourselves some slack, but when you're like, you need to come in and do this, 
we're like, oh, well, shit, you, you need to be perfect. You need to do this three times a week, this five days. Like, and, and that's what I like for like the biggest revealing moment for people is like, if you were to hire this out, here's where your expectations would be, just so you know. And you're not even living up to the expectations you would have if you were to hire this job out. Because I also like to do it in actual jobs. Like I do this for being the CEO of a company. If I were to replace myself, what would my expectations be? And if I'm like, okay, well, damn, that's a lot to expect of a person. Can I live up to that standard? If not, do I need to lower the standard? And so it really puts you in this like super, uh, you know, clear mindset of having, you know, what you can and cannot do. So I just want everyone to, to kind of think about that. And if we're bringing that down to fitness, you know, it really goes in line with what Kyle's saying about, how, you know, value. Like what, what do you let's just say as an athlete, as a person who participates in fitness, or maybe just as a human being, what's your standard? If someone were to come replace you in the fitness part of your life, fitness and health, what would, what would your uh, job description be? And could you honestly hold a person to that? Or would you have to either lower your standard? And now you have this range of what's expected, you know, and uh, a, a realistic expectation for yourself, and so I think going through that, that exercise, building your own standards, that's why I really like, and, and I talk about this all the time, the garage gym athlete standards. We have these standards, but then after you kind of get there, it's just trying to stay there. Like if you get to, and it, it doesn't mean getting to competitor, you don't have to be at competitor. Like you just say, a lot of people are going for fully established. If you're fully established, then it's more or less just staying there. And that could be a game for the rest of your life. Like even st staying competitor or established, that, those could be games for the rest of your life, just trying to maintain that. But we're not trying to do anything else, right? We're, we're not trying to go for perfection. There's no like, there's no more. There's only, this is what I should maintain. I should always be able to run a mile this fast. You know, like having that standard, uh, I think is, is phenomenal. And then other than that, the only slack you should allow yourself is within the standard. There's no further slack. You should be hard on yourself. If you say my minimum is three days per week and you do two days a week for four weeks, you're below the standard. Be hard on yourself. Start some negative self-talk, whatever the hell you have to do to get yourself back into it. Cause this is where I think this giving yourself grace and all this other crap, it, it gets a little out of control because it's too much like, yeah, we all got shit going on, but it's getting things done when we have all that other stuff going on that makes you mentally tough, that builds you into the person you want to be, not constantly saying, well, I had this thing going on. It's okay. Just, you know, give yourself a little slack. No, if the standard, if you have the standard, you stick to the standard. There's no not sticking to the standard. Uh, so that doesn't mean it, like if you're, if you're going through something tough, cool, go, go walk for 30 minutes. You got your training session done for the day. You can, the, you can lower the intensity, right? You don't have to do something perfect. You don't have to maintain the programming. You don't have to be training for an event, but you have to have a minimum standard of consistency, minimum standard in your diet, minimum standard of how you're going to perform in your job, minimum standard of how you're going to perform as a father and as a husband and all these things. I think you should have this minimum maximum standard. Uh, and so that's kind of where I land, land on, uh, on all this stuff with cutting yourself some slack when you should and shouldn't anybody else. No, I'm just thinking about when you were saying, um, how would you to have somebody else's uh, uh, standards if you were to program for them or, or give them their, their role? And I was thinking about being on strength on how I program for other people, but I'm on strength, so I have to do it too. And I'm just like, man, I hate myself sometimes. But I program this for other people and they're going to do it, so I'm definitely going to do it too. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's huge. I think in, in a lot of this, like me being on hard to kill now is just like, I'm always thinking of that because people joke around. Like I never programmed to myself, like maybe inadvertently with equipment at times, be like, I don't have that thing. So like we, like that could be a subconscious, uh, mistake when I'm programming, but I I'm never like, you know, here's what would be my favorite thing to do. Because to be honest, it might be harder than it's even programmed. If I were to just program for myself, knowing I'm the only one who follows it, I might be a little bit more like, yeah, let's see if uh, see if I can break myself here. You know, I have that I have that in me. I have that tendency. But when I know a lot of other people are following the same program, I want to keep them safe. I want to keep them healthy. I want to keep them optimal. Um, and so, yeah, I I keep myself to that standard, and you know, expect everyone to do the same. Uh, but we can uh, we can kind of move on here. Hold the line. Now we're going to talk about a whole mixture of, of mess. 
Um, Kyle, you're gonna brief or the workout or who who's briefing the workout? I think Joe said he had it this time. Yeah, I'll do it. So Gronk Bowl, this is a military thing. If you know, then you know. Um, there is, I don't know if there's actually explained in the um, brief video, but Gronk Bowl. So there's a lot going on. This was a uh, summation of you know uh, all of the, the team kind of put their own two cents in. Starts off with a if you have a bike, a one and a half mile ride or a 1200 meter row or run after that you will put on a weight vest then you will pick up a single plate so a single plate pinch for 400 meters and when you set if and when you set that plate down or or switch hands you will do 20 air squat penalty now you don't have to hold the plate during your air squat penalty but anytime you switch hands set it down whatever rest you will do a 20 air squat penalty during that 400 meters so once you get back you will do uh, the rep scheme is 10, 9, 8, 7, all the way down to one. So like a reverse pyramid, a uh, single kettlebell deadlift and a lateral box step ups each side on those reps. Then you will do a suitcase carry for 50 meters after each set of deadlifts with using your kettlebell. So single, um, single kettlebell deadlift, 50 meters um, each set after each set of deadlifts. And then you'll do your lateral box step ups. Then you'll do another 400 meter single plate pinch carry, same 20 air squat penalty for when you switch or rest. Then you can take your vest off if you're wearing a vest and then the same thing of mile and a half um, bike ride or 1200 meter row or run. So essentially it's a the same two things, buy in and cash out with that uh, 10, 10, 9, 8, 7, all the way down to one circuit in the middle. Did you catch all that? I will try and have a YouTube video. Yeah. Uh, there's a YouTube video and I'll also try and put it up on this uh, podcast on the screen. So if you're watching on YouTube, you'll be able to see the description somewhere. Uh, yeah. Look. I, I love how we all did that. All participated. Um, and people who aren't watching on YouTube have no idea what I'm saying now. All right. Uh, my one tip, I'm only going to give one and you can judge whether it's useful or not. My one tip is chalk up. Uh, this one takes a lot of grip, a lot of grip strength, um, especially for those uh, 400 meter carries. That's a single plate pinch with one hand. If you switch hands, you got to do, you got to pay the penalty. So uh, I would say chalk up. You're going to be using your grip quite a bit for this one. I don't know if I have a lot of tips for this one. Um, this is one of those where I just want to say go fast. Like, I don't yeah. know if I have like a, cause you're, yeah, you, you need good form. Yeah. You're the, the plate pinch carry. Um, we kind of talk about being strategic with that at times. Cause when grip goes, it goes and it's gone. It's not coming back uh, without several hours of rest or maybe even a day. So that's the thing. Um, it's kind of like that, uh, the iron mile. It's like after you set it down that first time, you're going to keep setting it down a lot, yep. you know? And so if you're a little bit more strategic at that, especially if you've never done the workout before being a little bit more strategic, I'm going to stop no matter what every hundred meters um, on this specifically or 50 meters or something, being more strategic in, in nature, even though there is that penalty, which there's no real such thing as a penalty in fitness. It's, it's all good for you and it's just squats. So whatever, you know, um, you just, you just go for it. So that's about all I have. But if I would say go fast somewhere, when you're doing single kettlebell deadlifts and lateral box step up, I, I would prefer um, quality over speed on those two movements specifically. Um, so I would say go hard on the the buy in and the cash out. So the 1.5 mile or the 1200 meters, this is where my go fast uh, advice comes into play. So just go fast. Like what do you what are you saving yourself for? Like you're you you're gonna be fine. You know, just go fast because uh, you you don't need a lot of lungs to do uh, single plate pinch carries or deadlifts or lateral box step ups. That this is the aerobic portion of the workout mainly, uh, and and in a large part. So just go hard on them and uh, see where you end up. Yeah, there's a like you said, there's not a lot of tips on this one. Um, if you have to sub for the plates for some reason, uh, for if you're going to use a kettlebell, you don't have to like go with the heaviest kettlebell that you own because um, kettlebells are way easier to carry than a plate pinch. And yeah, make sure your box is not too high. 
because you don't want to get out of position on those. I, I always like to say this in, in the briefs when I do them, um, because you just you should be pulling with your top leg and not pushing off your, of your bottom leg. But I don't really have a lot of tips either. It's just, it's just kind of a, it's kind of a, a different, very different one, a little bit of fun. It's not just, um, it's not, the, it's not the most simple as, as a lot of ours are, um, but it will still be very hard, especially those, those play pin carries. Um, yeah. And do your air squats fast. If you get to that point, if you are, whenever you yeah. have to do uh, switch or rest. Yeah, I want to see the person who does the whole thing with no air squats in the during the the plate pinches. Challenge accepted. Do it. Gosh. I don't know if I can. Uh, that's a mm -hmm. that's a hard one. Yeah, you one. can't change um, hands either. It's the same. Yeah. No, as in, no change plates, as in like oh yeah, yeah, like yeah. A real plate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, see, this is just a, like a paperweight down the road. <laughs> this is the hard one for me because like I have like the the bumpers. Like I have a, it's either a 25 pound bumper for me or it's a 45 pound steel plate. You know what I mean? And so that's the, that's what I'm, I'm working steel with. Plates be easy. Huh? Steel plates are definitely easier to carry than the bumpers. Yeah. Yeah. But 20 pounds heavier on one hand, you know, that's the, that's what you do with. Like, that's the choice. Like, which, which one are you going to do? So for Kyle, do what you're, everyone's harder um, and pick that one. It would be, probably be the fatter plate, to be honest. Um, Is this a good time to use 35s, Kyle? No, no. <laughs> 35s are useless. <laughs> I don't know. This is a pretty good in between. If you're just you like the really fat bumpers, because 45 really fat bumpers are like yeah. terrible, but then 25s might just be too easy. So I might allow 35s here. I, right. I think I'd be okay. The 35s would still be the steel plate. So it's a steel plate 35. Oh, well. At the best of all worlds there. Um, all right. So good luck on uh, Grog Bowl, uh, everyone. And hopefully we've uh, laid out some good advice for when it's okay to back off on this aerobic exercise is over the age of 45. You got you to gotta be careful. You got to look at all these things. Uh, like I said, everything everything matters to some degree and you need to pay attention to, to how to do it. The, the dosing for it, for everything is very important. And, and we don't look at that enough. I think uh, Americans specifically have a tendency of the more is better mentality, and that's not always the case. And so be, be mindful of that. Really. I, I think everyone should go read this study. If you are, are at all curious, I mean, heart health, is it number two or one? I think cancer, cancer and heart health, you know, uh, heart disease are the, the two big killers, right? Uh, over everything else on the planet. And so if you're serious about your heart health, I would dive into the study and look at it a little bit more. Uh, like I said, if you're kind of following our training already, then you're going to be good to go. And for, for those of you who are following the training, you know, thank you so much getting those green dots. You're holding yourself to a standard and you're supporting the community and, and we really appreciate it. And so thank you so much for being a part of everything that we have going on. If you have made it this far in the podcast, definitely go sign up for a 14 day free trial, try out the, um, the programming. And, you know, sometimes people try it out and then they're like, well, this isn't for me. And normally my answer is, okay, well, I mean, it's built for, it's built for humans to be optimal. So if it's not for you, then I understand that being an optimal human being might just not be for you, which is, it's a weird thing. So you can try it out and not do it, but I mean, you, are you really saying you don't want to be an optimal human being for the rest of your life? No, come on. If you try it out, you're going to stick around is my point. And so you can come try it out for two weeks. We do have a free trial. Maybe some things aren't for you, but ultimately I think it's all going to be for you and you're really going to like it. So sign up for that free trial and, uh, you know, see, see how you do like things. And then if, if you're listening and, uh, you haven't been getting uncomfortable at all, I want to urge you to do that. We talk every time we do a, talk about a book review, we talk about how it's not important to just read the book. It's important to take something away and implement that from the book. Even if it's a small thing, big thing doesn't matter. And I want to urge everyone listening to do that with a podcast, whatever we're talking about, like just see how you can implement. That's why we added the whole killing comfort, how to kill comfort with this thing. Kyle's killing comfort is fairly simple. I read off a hundred of them. 
But Kyle's like, Hey, how would you get off your ass and stand up? You know, how would you stand up a little bit more? And, uh, I agree with that. Like just try implementing something this week and see how it goes. See how you feel after doing that. Uh, take some action because if you don't kill comfort, comfort will kill you. To the Garage Gym Athlete podcast. If you want to learn more, go to garagegymathlete.com. You can learn about our training. Let us send you a copy of our book, The Garage Gym Athlete, or you can even get featured on the Garage Gym Athlete podcast. Thanks for listening.